When I first quit the wrestling team here at Duke, people used to say to me, it must be nice to have all that time back, or it must have been such a time commitment, or even, was it just too much time? And usually, I'd say yes, because it was easier than trying to explain that it wasn't the time, that the time was the last thing on my mind. If I had loved wrestling here at Duke, no amount of time would have been too much. I started wrestling as a freshman in high school and found out pretty quick that wrestling isn't a normal sport. You compete half naked, often under a spotlight, wearing a skin-tight leotard called a singlet. Odds are you'll get some skin infections along the way and you'll probably get injured too. Then there's cutting weight, where wrestlers will dehydrate themselves to lose 10, 15, even 20 pounds in the days leading up to a weigh-in, just to put it all back on before the competition. You might be sitting there thinking to yourself, wow, this sounds awful. Why would anybody do this to themselves? And while wrestling definitely sucked at times, I truly loved it. What most people don't see is that wrestling is an incredibly technical sport, one in which any athlete of any size with any body type can develop a unique set of moves that offer them an edge, and I think that's beautiful. To watch a great match is truly to watch two skilled dancers. The sport is cerebral and complex. It is the greatest competitive outlet that I have known and the single thing that has taught me the most about myself. By the time COVID rolled around my junior year of high school, I was hooked and all in on trying to get recruited to compete in college, but I didn't have the accolades I would need to earn Division I offers. As you might imagine, the sport isn't very conducive to social distancing, and my folks were COVID cautious. So, with the help and support of my parents, I moved out to pursue wrestling at 17. I spent four months living in an apartment, and another five living in the basement of my house, blocked off from the rest of the house, going down a ladder, up a ladder, through a window to get in and out. And other than the uh, home-cooked meals mom and dad were dropping off for me, I was living out of a microwave and a mini fridge down there. This wasn't just living on my own. This was living on my own during the height of COVID in the most COVID-restricted county in the country. I was alone 22 hours most days. Those two hours that I wasn't alone were spent at secret wrestling practices held in the upstairs of a church that all the best wrestlers within 100 miles were coming to. And on top of this, I was flying around the country, going to wrestling tournaments trying to get recruited. I wrestled for a team from Indiana at a tournament in Maryland. I flew to Virginia and Oklahoma by myself to wrestle without a coach in my corner. I tore my left MCL at a tournament in Bakersfield and had to drive the seven hours home with a bag of gas station ice scotch taped to my leg. Living on my own was not fun, but the wrestling was amazing. I had great drill partners, a phenomenal coach, and such a singular focus. I had found joy and consistency in a very uncertain time. In the summer going into my senior year of high school, I won a pretty big tournament called Reno Worlds and started to get real attention from college coaches. A few weeks later, I happened to run into a well-regarded coach who had made the trek out to a church practice. One of the great things about wrestling is it's pretty easy for you to show somebody how good you are, you just wrestle them. So as practice was winding down, I grabbed the coach and I asked him to wrestle for a bit and we rolled for 20 minutes or so and I was really trying to put it on him. And afterwards, he asked me about my college plans and I just spilled the story out to him about how I'd been living alone and flying around the country and doing everything that I could to try and get recruited. He told me that I could wrestle D1 and that he could help. A few weeks after we'd met, he sent an email introducing me to the coaches here at Duke, and just a little while after that, I had an offer to come wrestle here. When I showed up in Durham as a college freshman, it was clear pretty quick that I was not going to be a good fit for the Duke wrestling team. Wrestling here was very different from what I'd known. The coaching styles, the practice schedule, the values of the program, all of it. And as a retro freshman, I was sitting out the year from competing for the university. It's something nearly all freshmen do in Division I wrestling, but competition was the part of the sport that I loved most, and without it, it was hard for me to stay engaged. You can always tell when somebody's heart isn't in something anymore. I tried to hide how I felt, but I'm sure that it wasn't very hard to see. Five months in, somebody pulled me aside after practice and told me that I wasn't the kid who had lived alone because they love wrestling. That couldn't be me. They told me that not only was I letting down the person who'd stuck their neck out and introduced me to the Duke wrestling program, but that they'd never trust that person's word again. A week later, I was kicked out of practice, not even 10 minutes in, because I'd stayed on my knees too long during a warm-up drill trying to take a partner down. In the moment, it didn't feel real. I'd never been kicked out of a practice before in my life. I'd actually never seen anybody get kicked out of a practice before. I went back to the locker room and I showered just like I would have if I'd finished practice. And then I went back to my dorm. And when I got back to my room, I got into my bed 
and I cried so hard that I had to hold a pillow over my face because I didn't want anybody walking by to hear. I wasn't crying because of what had been said to me or because I'd been embarrassed or even because I'd been kicked out of practice. I was crying because I knew that I didn't love wrestling anymore, at least not this version of it. Eventually, I stopped crying, and I went about the day, rest of my day, as I would have if I'd finished practice, and I went to Team Lift that afternoon like nothing had happened. This was the first time that the thought of quitting wrestling ever crossed my mind, but I couldn't bring myself to do it. Wrestling was the most significant part of my identity. It was the first thing I ever loved to do, the first thing I was ever truly good at. Quitting felt like a sharp left turn, and not quitting, it felt like keeping on the same path. By the end of my freshman season, I had my routine down, walking from the bus stop to the gym, telling myself that I wasn't real and that practice wasn't real. I got really good at thinking of things to think about so that I didn't have to think about what I was actually doing. I got through my freshman season and then my freshman year and quickly found myself months into my sophomore year. During that time, I ate almost all of my meals alone. I had the worst grades in my life and I showed up late to all of my classes. I felt like I was watching everyone around me form relationships and get closer together from behind a glass wall. I showed up to every practice and I got less and less out of each one. One day, in late November of my sophomore year, I called my high school wrestling coach, Richie. And for those of you who have never met Coach Richie, he's quiet and stern and probably the most mysterious person I've ever met. And before I can even say anything, Richie goes, boy, I already know why you're calling. I'm like, huh? Well, why is that, Coach Richie? And he's like, it's that D1 wrestling, isn't it? So Richie and I talked, and he said something that really stuck with me. Coach Richie told me that wrestling was going to end for me one day, so why not make it on my own terms? I woke up the next day, and I quit the Duke wrestling team. Quitting wrestling is one of the best things that's ever happened to me. For one, it forced me to figure out what to do with myself when I didn't have 10 scheduled practices a week anymore. Any former athlete can tell you that that's a tough one. But it also gave me the opportunity to explore a lot of new things. I tried a lot of new things, socially, academically, and otherwise. And while I didn't like most of them, some of them, like programming, stuck. I found that writing code and building things actually evokes a lot of the same emotion in me that wrestling once did. It took me nearly a full year from the day that I was kicked out of practice to the day that I quit the Duke wrestling team. During that time, I felt that I was on a path forward wrestling for Duke and that quitting was a choice or a departure from this path. In hindsight, this mentality allowed me to shirk responsibility for how I was spending my time and how I was feeling. I had one foot out the door, and as a result, I got less out of wrestling than I would have if I had just committed. What Coach Ritchie encouraged me to do, and what I wish I could have done earlier, was to do things on my own terms and take agency for how I spent my time. I wish that I could have viewed the choice as a fork in the road. I could either choose to keep wrestling, or I could choose to quit wrestling, but I had to make a choice, take responsibility, and commit to making the most out of whichever path that I went down. I'm 22 years old. I know just enough to know that I don't really know anything yet, but I've used this framework to consider how I spend my time since I stopped wrestling, and it's helped me to navigate ambiguous and uncertain situations. Three and a half years ago, when I first started studying computer science, I liked that you could solve an objective problem subjectively. In CS 101 freshman year, my classmates and I would often come up with very different yet equally correct solutions to the brain teasers we were given to introduce us to the topic. This was enough for me to really lean in after I stopped wrestling. Since I picked that path, I found that I was right. Pretty soon, the problems get complex enough where there isn't a definitive right answer anymore. My favorite technical experiences have given me the latitude to be creative and forced me to learn, like developing research tools for a mechanical engineering lab or rebuilding a food delivery platform for the Duke and Durham community. My process starts with breaking a task down into smaller pieces and then trying to learn what I need to in order to do a given one. If it works, I move on to the next, but more often than not, I have to come up with and try out a few different approaches before things click. Sometimes I'm five or 10 steps in and I realize the decision I made in the beginning is gonna render the current task impossible. So I start all over. This might sound really frustrating, and it is, but the iterative process of trying to create something brings me joy and is only one of the only things that I can lose track of time doing. Figuring out what problems I want to try and solve hasn't been as straightforward. Like many Duke CS majors, my first dream job was working at a name brand big tech company in, say, Silicon Valley or maybe New York City. My sophomore summer, I had the chance to intern at a big tech company in San Francisco. 
Turns out that things don't move as fast working in an organization with thousands of engineers as they do when you're coding in your dorm room. I never quite found my groove that summer the way that I had working on my own projects or on smaller teams. But big tech was supposed to be the dream. So my solution was to work very hard to land a junior summer internship at an even bigger, better known tech company. Surprise, also wasn't the right fit for me. So I've decided to take a fork in the road. This March, I'll be starting my first full-time job working at a small company in a different industry in a new city. Hopefully it works out, maybe it doesn't. But I'm making the choice on my own terms and I can live with that. Thank you.